Hello everyone. Uh, my name is John Lustria here with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and today we're going to be talking about women nurses in the Civil War. Uh, so I'm just going to leave this uh, live feed up for a couple minutes, give people time to join the stream and uh, for you all to share it around and uh, we'll get started in just uh, just a couple minutes. Give people time to uh, join us and uh, for everyone to, to share and uh, I'll check back in with you in just a little bit. We'll go ahead and uh, and get going. Uh, yeah, where's uh, where's everyone watching from? Um, people on the East Coast, people on the West Coast, people outside of the United States. Uh, anybody uh, from outside the country watching? Okay. Ah, greetings from Georgia. That's exciting. Sarasota, Florida, wonderful. Jake's in D.C., oh, very exciting. Syracuse, New York. It's always fun to, to hear where people are, uh, are watching from. So before we uh, get started with the, the kind of formal programming here, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you all in the comments. Um, uh, if you have questions at any point during the presentation, go ahead and post them there, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get to those. See, we got people in Martinsburg, West Virginia, Annapolis, Maryland, Northern California, Silver Spring, Maryland, Biglerville, PA, and people from all over the place. So it's it's wonderful to be with you today. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is John Lustry. I'm the education coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and we just want to thank you for uh, being a part of these uh, these streams that we've been doing. We're trying to do them regularly every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at one o'clock covering uh, a variety of topics uh, about Civil War medicine. Uh, and these are, you know, great for us because it lets us uh, connect with, uh, with people uh, around the country who maybe can't ordinarily come to the museum. Um, and we're doing these specifically, of course, because no one is coming to the museum right now. Uh, we have, we're closed until it's deemed advisable to reopen because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis going on. So. Uh, these are important for us because um, they're, like I said, a way to, to connect with you all. Uh, and one way that you all, you guys can help us is by becoming a member uh, at the museum. Uh, membership is incredibly important even when we are open, and it's even more important now than ever, uh, now that uh, we're not regularly open to the public. So if you'd consider becoming a member, that would uh, be an incredibly uh, large benefit to us. It allows us to keep producing content like this and sharing uh, stories of hope um, from history um, with you all. So uh, please consider becoming a member or donating. Uh, every little bit helps um, and it definitely uh, helps us uh, as well uh, bring this stuff to you. Also, uh, if you don't, please uh, consider liking our Facebook page, following us on uh, social media and things like that, uh, our YouTube page where we're um, posting not only these videos, um, but other content that we're making um, during you know this time uh, when we're all <laughs> stuck at home. So uh, follow us across all our platforms, subscribe to us on YouTube, and like us on Facebook. Um, even that goes a long way. Um, to helping us. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, I'm going to turn, I'm going to have some notes here. I'm going to talk, you know, a little bit uh, from some prepared things. I got some questions sent to me in advance. I'll get to those and then I'll, I'll go through the comments and, and we'll, we'll tackle any questions uh, there. So female nurses uh, of the Civil War. So uh, over the course of some of these videos, you've heard some of my fantastic colleagues talk about what an uh, incredible resource the medical and surgical history is. Um, the medical and surgical history is a, a government document published shortly after the Civil War. It contains all kinds of information um, and statistics uh, about uh, c compiled by surgeons and later published by the government. It's free. It's accessible online. It's a great great research tool. Um, but the, one of the travesties of the medical and surgical history is that, uh, quote, female nurses only get 200 words in what is a, a, a massive 
compendium of information covering thousands and thousands of pages, um, you know, filled with great information. But but women nurses uh, barely get any play uh, in the medical and surgical history. So um, they, they don't get their due in sort of those, those official documents. And so um, we believe, you know, of course, their contributions are incredible uh, over the course of the war. And we're trying to uh, uh, spread that story a, a little bit more widely. And it's especially incredible um, what women are able to accomplish um, during the Civil War because um, at the beginning of the conflict, there effectively is no, uh, there's no nursing profession as we know it today, certainly not as we know it today. Um, there, there are few, if any, people getting kind of formal, official uh, nursing education. Um, there are kind of few written down best practices for what a nurse should do. There's not really a job description. So um, in some ways, I mean, it's, it's clear that, you know, jobs like changing bandages and things need to be done. Um, but the the need that the Civil War was going to present was just going to be so overwhelming um, that it was vital for uh, somebody, anybody to step into that role. And so uh, the Civil War, for kind of all intents and purposes, kind of creates the nursing profession uh, as we know it today, um, because so many people suddenly get nursing experience that just would not have had it otherwise. Uh, before the Civil War, so much of medical care was done in the home. Um, hospitals were um, places where kind of poor people uh, with few other resources would go, you know, out of desperation. If you were wealthy and you had enough money, um, doctors came to you um, in order to, to help you get better. So hospitals were kind of not looked on as a, that's a place where people go to get better. Um, and so because so much of this healthcare was was done in, in the home before the Civil War, um, the a lot of nursing duties, at least any experience that people had nursing, was also done in the home. Um, and that often fell to women, not always, but it often fell to women within the home to, uh, to help family members recover and get better. And uh, Clara Barton is actually a, a perfect example of this. Before the Civil War, Clara Barton, who of course is one of the most famous uh, nurses of all time, uh, Clara Barton had minimal nursing experience and, and where she derived all of that was when her brother David, uh, she, he had a bad fall during a, a barn raising and she was, you know, his kind of personal nurse assistant helping him get better. And so she picked up some tips and tricks, certainly, but um, I'm sure even Clara Barton uh, wouldn't have kind of suggested that maybe she was a, a complete and total expert in, in nursing, but there is some kind of basic level of, of experience that a lot of women in the United States would have had uh, when it came to nursing going into the Civil War. Again, it's not going to prepare them for, um, you know, one of the greatest healthcare crises uh, that ha has ever come to the United States, but it, you know, it gives them, you know, a, a basis to work with. Um, Initially, during the conflict, in the war's early days, um, the job of nursing was handled by uh, other convalescents in, in a hospital um, or those who had become too wounded in order to, um, you know, they, they couldn't fight anymore. So if they, they, someone had received an amputation, they were missing a, an arm or something like that, um, they would be kind of conscripted to help out in the hospitals. Now, this was especially problematic in the early days of the Civil War. So disease was especially rampant in the, in the very beginning of the Civil War because you have people, a lot of them from rural areas, all suddenly living very closely together, and most of them didn't have immunity um, to some of these epidemic diseases that would spread rapidly. And so in the, in the beginning, early days of the Civil War, the hospitals that did exist, which were very few, uh, were overwhelmed uh, by sick soldiers. And the people performing the nursing duties initially were other sick soldiers, which, you know, was fine. But as soon as they recovered, then they were sent back to their unit, which, of course, is as soon as they had gotten good at, you know, their duties. So there's not this knowledge base that's getting built 
in the early days of the Civil War. And so um, it's clear that there's a need for other people um, to do this. And so one substantial group that offers their services are women. Now, women did not have a lot, did not have a lot of kind of formal, um, you know, they didn't do or they, they weren't kind of allowed to ha hold a lot of kind of public facing roles and jobs in the public sphere. Um, and so the fact that, you know, they would go outside the home and, and do something like this was kind of unusual, but necessity uh, broke down a lot of barriers um, during the Civil War. And so uh, women, another reason that, you know, they, it was looked upon with, uh, I don't know, suspicion isn't the right word, but um, it would, people were sort of generally concerned um, that women, you know, maybe shouldn't be nurses, is that they're suddenly going to be, uh, many of them young and single, are going to be put in very kind of intimate spaces with strange men far from home. Uh, and this is just a totally new experience for, um, you know, 19th century society. Um, and it was, you know, they, they didn't want any, you know, we didn't want them to, to, didn't want things to, to, you know, spiral out of control or, or whatever. They didn't want any uh, wartime romances or things like this. It was a little too scandalous for them. But again, the overwhelming need uh, is what broke down the barriers uh, for the women in order to, to serve in hospitals. Somewhere around 22,000 uh, women served as nurses over the course of the Civil War. Uh, and I believe that number is between both the Confederacy and the Union. Um, I'm prepared to be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that that's correct. Um, and, and so they, they turned out in uh, just incredible numbers to help the overwhelmed military medical department uh, uh, with, with this, uh, this task. Uh, now, what exactly did these nurses do? Um, well, for they, they did all manner of different things, including uh, changing bandages, dressing wounds, uh, and things of that nature. Um, they were often uh, in charge of preparing food and running the kitchens uh, in, in the hospitals, some of the larger hospitals. And in some cases, they were uh, tasked with overseeing uh, uh, specific diets for soldiers. It was not uncommon um, for doctors to uh, prescribe specific diets for soldiers to have, um, you know, have lots of fresh produce. And so it would be the task of those running the kitchen. Uh, in many cases, uh, some of the women nurses, um, and they would, you know, get the, the orders, you know, patient A is supposed to have, you know, lots of vegetables, um, maybe not so much meat or vice versa, and they would they would prepare it according to the uh, the doctor's orders. Um, so uh, kitchens uh, and diets and things like this. Um, of course, they would help doing some of the less glamorous stuff, like doing the laundry. Um, laundress was a, a very common occupation for uh, a lot of women serving in hospitals. Um, you know, cleaning the uh, the bed sheets. Now, we don't tend to think of uh, the Civil War as being particularly sanitary, and um, to be fair, it's, it's not. Um, they hadn't discovered germ theory, uh, no germ theory uh, at that time. Um, but they start to notice as the, the war goes on that um, in, in the hospitals, they start to notice that cleanliness is related to good health. And so as the war goes on in general hospitals behind the lines, it was required that um, that uh, bed sheets and clothes be cleaned every single day. Um, and so that was uh, a, a job that women would sometimes be tasked with in the hospitals. Um, sometimes they would uh, even assist with surgery. Um, that wasn't, um, it's hard to say exactly how common that was, but again, when the need was there, uh, they would they would do such a thing. Clara Barton, um, sort of famously uh, on the battlefield at Antietam, uh, assists with uh, uh, with a few minor procedures, uh, and that would have been the case in in hospitals as well. Um, perhaps uh, most importantly, uh, they uh, these uh, nurses would sit with the soldiers and and talk with them and sometimes sing with them. 
There's uh, one nurse in particular, her name uh, was Clara Jones, and uh, she's from Philadelphia. Uh, one of the, the lesser known uh, nurses. We have her uh, letters in the collection at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, and I wrote a, a series of blog posts uh, about her, um, which I would recommend you read, not just because I wrote them, but because I think uh, her story is really cool. Um, but a lot of um, soldiers that she would sit with, um, sometimes they would they would send her letters, you know, once they recovered and, and went home, uh, and, you know, they would, uh, almost all of them would comment uh, on how much they enjoyed her singing. Um, so things like this, just talking with them, helping alleviate the boredom that some of the soldiers experienced being in hospitals was uh, was an incredible blessing um, for, for, for the soldiers. So uh, singing, talking, um, oftentimes they would uh, write letters home for the soldiers, um, especially if, um, well, perhaps they had had an amputation and are missing a, a, a right hand, uh, or perhaps they're just illiterate and they can't write. Um, they want their relatives to know that they are indeed okay. Um, so they would do things like that. Uh, and they would also uh, serve as administrators um, at varying levels. Uh, sometimes they would just be in charge of uh, overseeing a particular hospital ward, um, all the way up through um, an entire hospital. Uh, Claire Barton uh, was basically given, uh, put in charge of an entire hospital outside Petersburg uh, towards the end of the Civil War. Um, so they, uh, at times, could be given I immense responsibilities um, in, in these hospitals. Uh, let me see here. Uh, it's hard to talk about uh, women nurses in the Civil War without mentioning uh, Dorothea Dix. Um, Dorothea Dix, um, an incredible uh, life in the 19th century, um, known for her efforts to reform uh, mental institutions to, you know, raise the standards there and make them more increasingly uh, reputable, things like that. Um, during the Civil War, uh, almost as soon as the war breaks out in April of 1861, uh, she organizes, well, she goes to the, the War Department and says, you know, let me organize and head uh, a group of, of nurses, um, uh, of women nurses. And initially she is told no, but um, not being one to take no for an answer, she um, spends a lot of the Civil War getting her way um, as a result of persistence. Um, she eventually uh, gets a, a yes out of the federal government, and so she sets about uh, she's appointed superintendent of uh, army nurses, and she sets about raising initially a group of 100 women to serve in the hospitals. Uh, and that number over time, over the course of the Civil War, eventually grows to about 3,200 women that end up serving in Dorothea Dix's uh, group of, of nurses. Um, now, her the requirements that she had are interesting and, and noteworthy. So if you wanted to apply and become a part of this, um, she required that you had to have had measles already. So already there's some understanding of, you know, how disease works, what immunity is, and things like that. Um, they did have um, a vaccine, actually, for smallpox during the Civil War. So there, there's already kind of some early understanding of this that is very fledgling, admittedly, but um, Dorothea Dix knows enough that if you're going to be a nurse, you probably should have had this disease before, because nursing is dangerous work, of course, as, as you know, we even still are seeing today with people caring for, uh, you know, those with, with COVID-19. Um, we, we don't have good records of, of how many nurses, uh, you know, got sick or died um, during the Civil War, um, but it, it's... Um, it was, you know, more than a few people, unquestionably. Um, Clara Jones was told um, uh, by a, a doctor in, in one of the hospitals that she worked at that um, basically it was almost impossible for um, uh, nurses and other healthcare workers to essentially not get one of uh, either typhoid fever um, or, or uh, malaria or, or something of that nature. Uh, when working with uh, all the, the sick patients. So if you're going to be a, a nurse for a Dorothea Dix, you had to have had smallpox before. Um, 
you you couldn't be too pretty in her estimation. You had to be plain, um, and that is uh, as I mentioned earlier to kind of prevent prevent these um, kind of scandalous romances that might break out in a hospital, might be distracting or something. I mean, it sounds ridiculous to us today, uh, but this is something that she believed was important, uh, and she would frequently um, turn applicants away. Uh, from this, which, you know, again, kind of seems baffling to us today, given the incredible need um, that they experienced during the Civil War. Um, and then they also had to be subjected to a certain amount of training uh, before they would be uh, allowed to go out there. So um, the, this group of uh, uh, nurses was, was quite rigorous, even though they only made up uh, about 20% or so of all the nurses who served um, during the Civil War. And notable about um, Dix's group of nurses, uh, they got paid. They got regular paychecks um, for their services. Uh, and, you know, women, of course, getting paid was, you know, it was a thing in the 19th century. But um, for a woman to have a job that made money was kind of a big deal. Um, and so uh, that was uh, that was notable there. Now again, uh, Dorothea Dix and her nurses get a lot of press um, in terms of uh, Civil War nursing care, uh, but like I said, they only made up about 20% of the entire nursing force. Um, now, as for the rest of the the nurses who served, uh, whether they got paid, uh, it depended. Most of them did. Um, but there was a group um, like Clara Jones and Clara Barton who completely donated their time. Uh, and in the case of Clara Barton, um, donated a lot of her, her money in buying supplies and things like that to bring to the front, um, to, to, to give to the soldiers supplies and food and things like that. Um, so there were those that got paid and that it was, um, you know, a really positive experience from in that regard. But there were also those that um, sacrificed quite a bit um, to, to be a nurse. Um, sacrifice in terms of time, money, and sometimes uh, with their health, uh, like I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, let me see here. Ba -ba -ba. Yeah, so that's just a, a little bit, um, a little bit of an overview about uh, nursing during the Civil War. Um, something that's also um, relevant is what happens to these nurses after the war and, and nursing, you know, in, in the aftermath of the conflict. Um, it was notable that, you know, so many women um, were suddenly put into, you know, pub the public light. Um, they had, you know, taken paying jobs, work shoulder to shoulder uh, with men, proved to do a very good job. Um, and so this was kind of notable, and, and you start to see in the latter part of the, the 19th century, a lot of nursing schools start popping up. Nursing as a profession really kind of starts coming into its own because um, they're, again, demonstrated uh, how important it was that, that um, you know, nurses be on hand for this sort of thing. So there, there's uh, all kinds of, you know, great experiences um, and, and barriers broken down by, by women nurses. Now, there wasn't this, you know, immediate, um, you know, switch that got flipped in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. Um, like suddenly everyone, um, you know, suddenly decided that, uh, you know, women should, you know, women everywhere should be nurses and things like that. I mean, there was there was more kind of social barrier breaking to go. But but this the Civil War marked a, a really important kind of first step uh, on that path. Uh, and after, long after the Civil War, um, eventually nurses could apply for pensions. Um, now, the pension program existed for soldiers um, uh, during the Civil War and, and, of course, long afterwards. Um, but Civil War, and then eventually that got extended to widows and, and families and things like that uh, of, of veterans. Um, but in 1892, um, Congress passed the Army Nurses Pension Act, um, which allowed uh, nurses who served at least six months to draw a monthly pension of $12. Uh, and uh, in records at the um, National Archives, um, from that we know about 2,500 women uh, ended up uh, applying 
um, for, for a nursing pension. Now, like all pensions, um, it, it could um, be challenging um, to kind of prove the service claims, especially if you were a volunteer nurse like Clara Jones was. Um, you, you know, if, if you got paid, there was a paper trail that you had, you know, served as a nurse, but if you volunteered your time, um, then you had to corroborate, you know, with, uh, other, other people, uh, who you served with and things that you did actually serve or, and, and then you also sometimes would run into the problem, you know, if you, uh, only serve five months, um, then that was frustrating, of course. Um, so, it, it was challenging to um, to to acquire a pension, um, but necessary for uh, for some people. And, and there was uh, an organization that formed um, in the aftermath of the Civil War called the uh, National Association of Army Nurses of the Civil War, uh, and they were tireless advocates in trying to um, a pu push for that act in the first place. Uh, and uh, soften the minimum requirements and, and things like that. Um, so there were kind of lobbyist groups for uh, nurses in the aftermath uh, of the Civil War as well. So that's uh, uh, a little bit about women nurses in the Civil War. It's hardly comprehensive. Um, there's so much more to say uh, 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 about the subject, but that just gives you an idea um, of, of what that experience was like. Um, I got a couple uh, questions emailed to me, one from Sean, who is um, studying at Southern New Hampshire uh, University and who is a, a critical care paramedic. So uh, doing some good work, uh, not just now, of course, but um, so thank you, Sean, for all the work you're doing. Uh, he asked, um, you know, what was women's role in nursing before the Civil War? Um, so like I mentioned earlier, um, in the home. Um, largely, you know, nursing with family. Um, not a lot in, in hospitals or, you know, or in other public spaces uh, like that. And then his follow-up question is, you know, how did that change with the Civil War? Um, the Civil War is a, a huge watershed moment, uh, not just for women nurses, um, but, um, but for the nursing profession in general. Um, it, it's, it's a huge wake-up call to the fact that this is a good thing that uh, should be around. Um, he also asks, um, was it common for a nurse to go to the battlefield and perform triage? Um, it was not unheard of for um, women nurses to be on the battlefield while the battle was happening. Clara Barton is, is a very famous example of that. Um, but it was uncommon. Um, it was uh, more common that they would be in uh, either field hospitals behind the lines or in um, general, more permanent general hospitals um, very far behind the lines, you know, in larger cities. Um, that's where the majority of nurses served, um, less so on the battlefield. Uh, and it would have been uh, very rare for them actually to perform triage um, on the battlefield. Um, so it wasn't unheard of that they would be out there, uh, you know, while the guns were firing, but it was, it was uncommon. Uh, and then his last question, uh, was it common for nurses to assist with surgery? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it did happen, um, but it's hard to say exactly how common it was. Um, and then I got a, one other question from, uh, hold on, let me, let me uh, make sure I have the name right. Um, do, 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 do. it's right here. Bear with me. Uh, Patty, um, she asked a question, uh, not so much about nursing, but about women, uh, intersecting with healthcare. Uh, she asked what the death rate, um, for women in childbirth was in the 19th century. Uh, and from what I could find, that was, um, about five to 10 deaths out of every uh, 1,000 births uh, or thereabout. Um, so that, that's what I was able to find. So with that, the questions that were sent to me ahead of time, let's take a, a stroll through the comments here and see what we got. Okay. Uh, 
Christie uh, from Syracuse. Uh, you're an author writing a book about a Civil War hospital. Uh, glad to hear that this is indeed timely and helpful for you. Uh, also, great time to be working on a book. <laughs> um, let's see. Scrolling down. Do, do, do. Okay, yes, uh, and, and I'll also take this time as I'm scrolling by some of the, the comments posted by my colleague Jake. Um, uh, if you could consider donating or, or becoming a member to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, every little bit helps us um, with our doors closed and we're not able to, to take admission money and group tours aren't coming here and, and to, to the museum and all that stuff. So. Um, you know, if you can uh, provide donations or memberships, that is uh, incredibly beneficial from, uh, for us. I see Andrea from the National Museum of Health and Medicine is watching, um, which is an incredible site um, with some Civil War origins. It was um, uh, uh, founded in 1862, originally as the Army Medical Museum by the uh, then Surgeon General William Hammond. Um, and the idea was for them to collect medical specimens so that um, we could learn something, hopefully, from the Civil War. Um, so, yeah, the National Museum of Health and Medicine in, uh, I think, Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, it's an absolutely incredible site. Um, I recommend you, you go over there when you can uh, and, and check them out. And also check out their website because I'm sure they, they're also doing some pretty cool digital things. So uh, always good to have our friends from the Museum of Health and Medicine uh, watching with us. Uh, so Edward was curious about the Catholic nuns that served as nurses. Um, yes, so uh, they're, uh, they're included in that 22,000 number. Uh, nuns from at least 12 different orders ended up serving uh, as nurses, and, and in some cases they were uh, written about uh, in a very, uh, uh, you know, po positive light. They were um, sometimes requested specifically, um, you know, by people running field hospitals, you know, in the aftermath of a battle, sometimes uh, surgeons would write to these monasteries and say, you know, can you come help us out? A, because we need it, and B, because, you know, we've heard what great work that, that they do. So um, nuns were, uh, were a very common fixture, um, especially in the aftermath of, of battles. Uh, the most well-known um, order um, to, to serve uh, as nurses during the Civil War were the Sisters of Charity in Emmitsburg, Maryland, uh, and they uh, helped out after the Battle uh, of Antietam, the Battle of Gettysburg, both fought pretty nearby, um, and, and even more uh, beyond that. So yes, you're quite right to point out um, the incredible role played by nuns um, in the Civil War. Let's see. Ah, the uh, Country Doctor Museum. Tess is tuning in from the Country Doctor Museum in North Carolina. Uh, they came to vi visit us at the Museum of Civil War Medicine um, a year or two ago now. Um, so it's, uh, it's always good to have uh, fellow museum uh, people watching with us. Let's see. Uh, Melissa, who uh, just defended her dissertation yesterday, um, would love to hear about the class dynamics of women nurses if you have time. Uh, or maybe talk a bit about quarantine. Topical. <laughs> Indeed, you're right. Um, so I, I'm not an expert on the class dynamics uh, of nurses, um, although, you know, uh, there's, it's unquestionable that they existed. Uh, so Clara Jones, someone who I've, I've read extensively, um, she w was single and had to, that's why she was a volunteer nurse, that she had another job that she had to, to be at, you know, most of the time she was a teacher. And so anytime she was uh, on break from school, she would go volunteer her time at hospitals. She lived in the, in the Philadelphia area and she was um, just so irritated um, by the upper class women. So she, Claire Jones did not come from money, but she was so irritated by the upper class women. Um, and she basically wrote, um, I think her exact words were, what good can they do in their silks? Um, basically, she, she, you know, the whole idea was, you know, they don't know the first thing about nursing or working hard. So what are they doing here? They're, they just want to be seen somewhere. And, you know, maybe that's, um, you know, being a bit harsh. 
Um, but that gives maybe sort of an idea. I'm, I'm sure there had to have been resentments um, in, in cases like that. Now, something also that I don't know much about, but I'm sure existed um, in the, the Union Army, um, African Americans um, oftentimes would serve uh, either as nurses, typically more in kind of behind the scenes work, um, but the interaction between white nurses and black nurses, I'm sure, was an interesting dynamic, to put it mildly. And, you know, I, I'd like to believe in, in a number of cases it, you know, went off without, without a hitch, but um, I'm, I'm sure there was some conflict uh, there as well. Um, quarantine, though, um, that's a great question. So they, at, at the time of the Civil War, as I said, they didn't know about germ theory, but they did kind of know enough about disease to know that hmm, this seems to be spreading from person to person. They don't know exactly how that works, but they know that, that it is a thing. And so it was not uncommon um, once these kind of larger general hospitals got established um, to establish certain wards of the hospital to be, you know, if you have gangrene, you're quarantined in this, in this ward. If you have typhoid fever, you're quarantined in this ward. Um, so they knew um, about kind of keeping people separate. They, they knew about quarantine. That was a word that they would have used. Um, and so um, sometimes, you know, it, it it would be possible for, you know, a doctor or a nurse to be assigned to the gangrene ward or, or you know, whatever. Um, so quarantining was something that happened um, during the Civil War. And, and one of the more famous cases of quarantining uh, was with the 20th Maine. Um, uh, during, during the Battle of Chancellorsville, there was a bad outbreak of, I think, smallpox. Um, and so they missed out on the Battle of Chancellorsville because they were kept separate from the rest of the army to prevent that from being spread. Let's see. Ah, great question from Robert. Uh, was Florence Nightingale, a Crimean War example, um, uh, perhaps a role model for Civil War uh, women nurses? Uh, absolutely. Um, so Florence Nightingale, um, though she never kind of helped people in the, in the aftermath um, uh, of the Civil she never actually serves um, in, you know, in the United States during the Civil War, but she would have been pretty well known um, in the United States. And uh, she had written some books um, before the Civil War about uh, hospital administration, hospital design and construction. I mean, she, um, there was plenty of literature and press out there about her. So um, I have to imagine, uh, in fact, I know um, that Nightingale was uh, something of a role model and inspiration um, uh, and, and all that sort of thing. And it also kind of provided a template for people that maybe couldn't process the idea of women nurses. There was someone else that had already done this sort of thing and already proved to be immensely beneficial. Uh, her work in the Crimean War um, was incredibly helpful. So that you're great to point that out. Let's see here. Uh, yes, uh, Melissa, uh, mentions that she'd love to see a, um, you know, study about women in hospital administration. I would too. Um, so anyone out there that wants to write that book or that article, uh, be my guest. Uh, I think it would certainly be very interesting. Um, Janet says, good talk. Thank you. Uh, I want to know about Civil War nurses. What writings have been left behind? Um, well, there's a, a handful of, of both primary and secondary, secondary sources out there. Um, so, for example, of course, we have Clara Jones' letters from her time as a nurse uh, in the collection of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Um, so they're out there. Um, uh, and we have some transcriptions that, um, you know, I'm sure we could, we could probably send around or something. I'm not sure exactly what our policy is on that. But anyway, that, that exists. Um, Clara Barton's, uh, almost all of her letters and diaries are publicly and freely available on the Library of Congress website. Um, so that's a great resource. Um, you know, let's see, if you go to uh, our website, uh, civilwarmed.org, uh, and you, we have a, um, uh, online resources, you know, for students and teachers and history enthusiasts, and there's a, a primary sources uh, page. Um, and if you, you find your way to that, um, um, 
we, we have a, a list of um, Civil War nurses memoirs and, and letter collections that are freely available online. Um, so that's where I'd recommend starting. Um, and then there's a, a great book um, called by um, Jane Schultz called uh, Women at the Front, um, all about uh, women nurses in the Civil War, which uh, I highly recommend. Let's see. Uh, Robert asks, are there any stats uh, concerning what percentage of nurses contracted a disease? Uh, I wish there were, um, and, and maybe there are, and I just don't know about them, um, but not that I have encountered, um, unfortunately. Let's see, uh, the Army Nurses Pension Act, uh, only for union nurses, uh, Janet asks. Um, more than likely, uh, I'm not a thousand percent certain on that, but uh, I'm fairly certain that that was the case um, because that was the case for the regular pensions. Um, if you served to, uh, you know, if you served in the Confederate Army, the federal government, uh, you know, wasn't going to give you a pension for your service in the Confederate Army. Um, you know, obviously with healthcare workers, it's a little bit different, um, but I, I believe it was primarily for uh, union nurses. Um, let's see, Christy asks, what were the initial community volunteers who helped with nursing at post hospitals required to formally apply to Dorothea Dix before they continued to work for pay? Um, so the Dorothea Dix nurses, that was just kind of one grouping uh, of, of nurses. They could apply, but if they wanted to pitch in and help out, um, they, they didn't need to do any sort of application. Um, and nurses did get paid um, outside of uh, Dix's group of nurses. Um, so uh, you could, I think you, you probably would have had to apply to you know, the person in charge of the hospital. I'm not sure how the 19th century job application worked, but um, there, there, there were ways you, know, you, you could get paid and not be part of uh, Dix's group of nurses. Um, so let's see here. Um, ah, yes, uh, Linda chimes in, uh, absolutely correct, Harriet Dame um, of New Hampshire and Annie Etheridge from Michigan uh, were both Civil War nurses who served on the field under fire. Uh, Claire Barton, of course, is the, is the famous example, but there are uh, others um, like Harriet Dame and uh, Annie Etheridge. Um, let's see here. Uh, Christy uh, posted a cool excerpt from the, um, um, shoot, I just scrolled past it, a uh, cool excerpt from the Army Surgeon's Manual in 1864 regarding nurses and nursing. Um, check that out. Great primary source find. Putting that in the comments. Thank you. Uh, let's see. My great-grandfather was an assistant surgeon with the 11th PA, writing a novel, too, based off some of his uh, experiences. So that sounds very cool. Um, looking forward to that. Ah, uh, yes. So Andrea from the National Museum of Health and Medicine um, gave them a, a shout out earlier. She uh, clarifies that they're currently closed, but if anyone has questions about their Civil War collections, just reach out through their website. We have archival, historical, and anatomical collections, and they're all super cool. Um, I added that last part. Um, yeah, again, um, definitely check out their website. When things start opening up, uh, definitely uh, go over there and, and give them a visit. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, do we have a sense of the number of fatalities among nurses during the Civil War, Christopher S. Uh, again, um, I don't, um, I, I wouldn't be shocked if somebody out there knows that, but uh, I, I'm not sure. Let's see, ah, Wendy uh, asks, can you talk a little about the nurses of the U.S. Sanitary Commission? Did they need to apply? How were they chosen? Um, where were they used most often? Um, so the U.S. Sanitary Commission, one of the uh, more notable, uh, one of the more notable uh, organizations from uh, the Civil War. So in the early days uh, uh, of the, the conflict, when it became clear that the military medical department was just not 
prepared to deal with uh, you know all of the uh, the the number of sick and wounded soldiers um, the U.S. Sanitary Commission kind of uh, was created to help address this need. Um, so it was a, a private uh, organization. It it's not related to, but it kind of functions similarly to the um, the modern day Red Cross. Um, they're there for disaster relief. Um, well, in this case, war relief um, with the Sanitary Commission. Um, and women were a huge part of the Sanitary Commission. Um, they would bring supplies in the aftermath of battles. They kind of uh, raised the, the standards in hospitals behind the lines uh, and things like that. So um, uh, so women were, were incredibly huge as a part of that. Um, sometimes they would uh, ho host um, campaigns um, you know, raising money um, to buy supplies to, to send to, to soldiers or, or doctors in hospitals. Um, and there was a, a particularly great campaign um, to send food, um, concerned about, you know, soldiers getting fresh produce. Um, there was, there was a great sanitary commission um, campaign that was led, spearheaded by women. Um, and it had one of my favorite Civil War slogans. Um, again, they're aware of the health benefits of vegetables and things like that. So the, the slogan was, don't send your loved one a letter, send him an onion. So uh, these are the sort of things that, you know, they would do behind the lines. Uh, oftentimes they would go um, to field hospitals in the aftermath of battles, um, famously uh, after Gettysburg um, and, you know, a host of other battles. Um, as for needing to apply, I don't know uh, what the application process uh, was like, um, and I'm not even sure you know, if they got paid because I think it was you know, largely a charitable organization. Um, so my guess is they don't, and because of that, it's probably they would take all helpers, uh, you know, all, all applicants. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, the best I have about that. Uh, Andrea, glad that you found this uh, fun and informative. Let's see, thanks from Colorado. Nice. Uh, Jimmy says, was there a lasting impact legacy by women breaking through that barrier to serve as nurses during the war? Uh, was there a direct impact felt in the immediate aftermath of the war? Um, absolutely. Um, the, you know, this is one of the kind of major ways that kind of women insert themselves into public spaces during the Civil War. So that, you know, in itself is, is sort of novel. Uh, and that experience definitely carries through. Nursing as a profession um, really comes into its own. And it's, um, you know, it, it's proven over the course of the war that it's, you know, clearly something that uh, women are good at and, and, you know, are given sort of tacit societal approval to do um, things like that. Um, so the, the, it, it's not like, like I said earlier, it's not like a switch gets flipped that like suddenly everyone's like, oh my gosh, women are awesome. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a much more gradual process, but it, it's, it's a very, very, very important kind of beginning step, um, to kind of how, how things change going forward. Um, okay, let's see. See, James says, what was the average service life of a Civil War nurse? Uh, male nurses like Walt Whitman served as well and suffered from PTSD. Uh, were there problems with nurses suffering from PTSD after or during the war? Great question. Um, the average service time uh, for a nurse could vary greatly. So Clara Barton um, sort of famously serves uh, almost, you know, for the duration of the conflict. Um, so it could be very long. Um, in the case of Clara Jones, who um, uh, uh, had another job elsewhere, um, you know, she was a teacher, she could only serve during school breaks, you know, she would typically serve during the summertime, so she would serve for months at a time, then have to go back, sometimes even during, like, you know, their Christmas break, um, she would serve for a week at a time, she'd go to the, you know, take a trip down to... Washington, D.C., and, and work in one of the hospitals there. Um, so 
it, it could vary wildly. Um, some cases, you know, uh, some women who decided to volunteer their time or work, you know, since they were getting paid, um, some viewed this basically as their job. Um, and so they, they signed on for the whole war and they were just saying, this is, this is what I'm doing now. Um, but in some cases, especially with volunteers, um, it, it could be a bit more spotty. And sometimes, of course, um, uh, if you got sick, that could curb your, your service time. So there are all kinds of factors um, that went into that. Now, a great question about, um, you know, Walt Whitman um, and, you know, whether whether or not people suffered from PTSD um, after or during the war, um, you know, unquestionably so, being around death um, like that so much, or at least distress, um, you know, it would have to leave some sort of impact. Again, it's hard to kind of quantify that stuff since they're not, you know, they have a totally different set of language and aren't really thinking about that very much. But we can pick up some clues here and there. Um, we have a great blog post um, on our um, uh, on the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office uh, website, uh, clarabartonmuseum.org, about Cornelia Hancock, who was a nurse during the war, and um, Melissa, who uh, who wrote that. Um, it pulled pulled a great quote, you know, reading closely to kind of get a sense of what the emotional world is like. Um, uh, she wrote that my senses were benumbed, um, that there was this kind of numbing effect um, that fell over some of these women, um, and, well, and doctors too. Um, so uh, there there was some experience with that. It's super hard to quantify, of course, uh, but that's a great article. I'd recommend going reading that. Um, if you if you just Google my senses were benumbed, you know Cornelia Hancock. I'm sure it'll come up. Um, and and then we also have uh, a, an article about um, the kind of emotional toll things took on Civil War surgeons um, on CivilWarMed.org and. Um, I'm blanking on the title of that, something about like my hands and heart were heavy or something that that was a quote from one of the surgeons. So uh, we do have some literature about that on our websites, but um, so that that was definitely something that they would have experienced. Let's see. Ah, uh, Yes, and, and Melissa pub, uh, commented with some excellent primary sources, um, free and available um, about Civil War nurses in the comments. So definitely check that out. Um, Robert asks, as Clara Jones traveled back and forth, did she have to pay for her own expenses? Uh, yes, she had to pay for everything. Um, you know, since she's volunteering her time, um, she, um, you know, is doing this because it's something important she thinks she should do. And so no one's covering anything, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and then Melissa also uh, posted some fantastic secondary sources uh, about uh, Civil War nurses. So thank you, Melissa, um, for helping me out there. Uh, Janet asked, did the term soldier's heart apply to nurses? Uh, I have wondered about my great grandfather. So just like I was saying earlier about PTSD, um, they don't have the language for it that we have today. And it, it went by a number of different names um, and Soldier's Heart was one of them. Um, so yes, it, it absolutely would have applied. Uh, other terms that sometimes would get used for something like this, uh, irritable heart, nostalgia, old soldier's disease, uh, it, it went by a variety of names. Uh, and of course, it, I should also note, you know, we, we should always be a little careful about reverse diagnosing this sort of thing. Um, because, you know, we're just, we're working with different sets of information. So, the, but the best we can do is kind of try and read between the lines. Um, so, um, there you go. And I seem to have reached the bottom of the comments. So, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I... I hope you hope you enjoyed uh, the the presentation, and it was wonderful getting to chat and interact with you all all over the the, the country. Um, and you know, stay safe, stay healthy. 
Uh, and again, if you'd consider uh, donating or, or becoming a member uh, at the museum uh, would be incredibly uh, beneficial for us. Um, again, our doors are closed until it's deemed advisable to reopen. And so um, a, a donation or a membership goes a long way to helping us continue to do programs like these. So on Friday, that's going to be the next uh, program. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, Civil War medicine and how it links uh, with uh, how it relates with medicine in World War One and kind of tracing that development. So um, hopefully, uh, hope to to see see you on uh, Friday at one o'clock.